I loved school back in my day. I spent uh, three years, the best part of my life, in the fifth grade. <laughs> That's not true. That's a joke that me and Gary Riggins used to tell her all over the country, so I said, <clears throat> there was only two. It's good to love the Lord, isn't it? It's good to love the Lord. Amen. You, it's just good to have a, a, a few of you that I've not seen in a, a, a few weeks, a couple from uh, uh, way up that went to New York. I don't know what you would go to New York, spend a summer for. I can't figure it. And uh, but I'm trying to work it out. Good to have you back, indeed. Praise the Lord. And uh, good to have each of you. Let us turn to the scriptures. We're talking in the book of Philippians, uh, in the book of Thessalonians. Uh, that wasn't even close, was it? I'm finding so much in this uh, these sections because. In expository, you look down and it just seems that everything applies and everything seems to, to fit. So let's go to 1 Thessalonians, the first chapter, and uh, today we would, we would deal with verses 5 through 10. We spent a, a couple of weeks on the first two, uh, or the first five verses. It won't be that slow going through, but we had to, had to get it started. We by now know a little bit about uh, the Thessalonica and the church and uh, uh, the persecutions that they were going under and that they were facing. For example, uh, Paul was ran out and uh, uh, so when he left, uh, he had already preached the sermon, preached the message and did teaching uh, for several weeks, several days in a row, over and over again. And when he left, they continued on. And they grew, and yet they, were, they too were being persecuted. And so that's the, that's the background of what this book is written and how it's written. It's also written with the idea that it was in a strategic place on the earth. The Roman, Roman road went right through it. It was right on the, uh, uh, the sea, all the seaports, everything. It was the largest city, uh, 200,000. Uh, and uh, it's just amazing that in that spot, the gospel was, was taught, was presented, was taught, was copied into their hearts, and then distributed. Now you understand the process that I just mentioned to you. Copied into your hearts, brought into your spirit, and distributed. So it wouldn't have mattered if Paul would have preached the greatest sermon that he ever preached, and he may have, I don't know. But it might have been the greatest sermon ever. Wouldn't have mattered if it had not have been received into their hearts. Amen. And once it was received into their hearts, there it ended. No. Then they distributed. And that, my friend, is the mature church that we're wanting to arrive at. Now there's a lot of reasons and, and a lot of uh, hurdles to get over to become that. Some of it is, as I've already pointed out, is our interaction within the body itself. How we treat each other, how we love God, and how we love each other. How we're challenged in our faith, how we're challenged in our love. All of that it, it makes us mature or immature. And the example is, compare Thessalonians with Corinthians. One was just to show me uh, a show-off church. Uh, look at me because uh, I'm pretty special. And the other one was Thessalonians, which Paul says, I admire how you're handling the Word of God. All right? So with that background in mind, let us, let us proceed with today's lesson. And today's lesson is just simply contagious. The word contagious. Let us read the Word. For when the... Okay, proclamation. We're proclaiming and we're contagious in our proclamation. And now we'll we'll read the word. Thank you. She's uh, uh, upset with me because I told her I had to see her last week. She didn't show up. So she thinks she's in trouble. And she didn't even know it. 
For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. And you know of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. So you received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. Are you looking at all the words? that's mentioned there and, and, and all the dynamics that's going on. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece, all the believers in Greece, both northern Greece and southern, the, the to Macedonia, and they put them all, all, the whole area, you become an example to us. That's, those are the words that we'll be reading verses uh, up, up through verse 5 through 10. Now, today I want to begin uh, a short series before we get into it in, in heaviness next week on evangelism. What is evangelism? It is the proclamation of something that is dear to your heart that you're wanting to put into another person. I like to look at it that I evangelize my two children. That's what a father's really jo real job is, and a mother, is that we're to evangelize our family. And if, if, if we look at it like, uh, man, I must do that, then it becomes uh, contagious. It's not just, uh, uh, you, you don't get much done unless it just roots in your heart and just builds up in your spirit, you just don't, you don't accomplish too much. Now you know I'm telling you the truth that last week we spoke on what? One of the, one of the values or the, uh, of, of this church was they were not lazy. They were busy distributing the word of God and meeting together and praying together and supporting one another. They were not lazy. And so evangelism comes about because we or contagious in our spirit. It's just something that's building up in us and it must come out. Now in order for that to happen, there's got to be something in there. And for so long, we have ignored the fact that uh, I've got to put something in and the more I put in, will come out. We just say, well, God, you're going you're gonna to take care of it. You're gonna, you're gonna fix it. You're gonna make me. You're gonna make me res, uh, respond to the needs and, and so. No, if you're contagious, if it's inside of you, it'll just bubble out, and you will just go forth, and you will share your great story. Amen. Now, that's a, th these are not a, a, a condemnation sermons whatsoever. These are sermons that would challenge our hearts to look at our church first of all. And then, of course, to look at ourselves, or look at ourselves, and then look at our church. Either way it is. What is evangelism? It is nothing, it is nothing short of receiving and then proclaiming. You can't proclaim that which you don't have. It is the good news. It is the good news that's mentioned in the scripture over and over again. The good news. Paul says, I come with the good news. And the good news always began with his new birth. The good news always. Oh, your, your grace story is not a grace story if it doesn't deal with your redemption. And it must deal with your redemption. You must be saved. The word of God said if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the base. That's the foundation of a grace story. Evangelism is just simply telling somebody about that. Amen? Yes. And it's not some class. It's not some memorized words. But it is simply what has happened to you. Have you ever sat with a sermon that has points 1, 2, 3, 4, and 11. And they all just sort of make sense. But they don't make sense. Because of no passion. Because you feel like that person even hasn't connected with that lesson. Not necessarily a sermon, but it can be a class lesson of any kind. That there doesn't seem to be a connection there. It's like a millionaire coming and holding a class on poverty. 
with all people there sitting in poverty. There's no connection. Well, a great story has to have connection. There has to be a connection between your heart and the cross. There has to be an understanding that you could not make it without Him. But since He has come in your life, you are now the prince. You are now the God's person. You're God's voice. That's level, the next level that we, uh, we'll talk to perhaps uh, in a moment or two. Now what does he say? He says, this, uh, where's the one with joy? So you receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of your suffering. Now folks, I know that this country, this world has gone through suffering as of late. I want to assure you that it's not going to get better. I know that that's, we think that it is, but it's not. Food shortage is about to become, we say, well, how in the world can there be a famine? We're about to see. We're about to see. Already some of our third world nations are, the starvation is just out of sight with children. It, it just breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. And in this country, they say, and I don't know what they mean by, uh, I just, just read that this past week, that two million children go to, uh, go to bed every night hungry. Now, I don't understand that statistic, but uh, it must come from somewhere. Well, all I'm trying to say is we're on the verge of something, a big threat of the enemy, and that's why Thessalonians is so important. Here's what he says. No matter what happens, by the way, whether it's that or whether it's a, a, just a deep recession or a, a, whatever, we, our money runs out. No matter what the crisis is, here's what he says in verse 6. So you receive the message with joy. Everybody say joy. You receive the message with joy. Now this is the word. I'm just, I'm just talking to you as the word goes through. You receive the message with joy. What was the message? You receive the message of the cross with joy. Now what is the message of the cross? Does it just involve the salvation? Does it just involve the, the forgiveness of our sins? The message of the cross is this. Follow me. Follow me. Lose your life. And take up my life. Amen. The message of the cross is not an easy message. If it's taken seriously and we live it out properly, it's not an easy message. We have to lose our life to gain His. I know we don't want to do that. That's why we hang on to flesh. Because I like the flesh. Everybody likes the flesh? Am I the only one? Well, goodness. Let me put my hands down. We like to hang on. And Jesus, is, Jesus said... Deny yourself, take up my cross, and follow me. Now, pastor, that requires death. Death of the flesh. Just as Jesus demonstrated as he walked on the earth. And then and finally he had to crucify the flesh. That flesh was what we are. He became flesh so we would know what it was like. And so he crucified the flesh. And what did he have to do? Man, this is not my notes at all. But what did he have to do? He had to go talk to the Father just before it happened. And he was, oh my, the flesh was panicking. I want to tell you what. The Christian church has gotten very comfortable going to heaven and living in the flesh. Did you hear what I said? We've gotten very comfortable putting up with the flesh and calling ourselves sons of God and women of God. Now that doesn't mean we're not sons and women of God. It doesn't mean that. It just means that, oh my, what more could I do? How, how greater could my great story be if I didn't have that battle of flesh still hanging upon me? <laughs> Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. He says, now with joy. Let's respond to that. You receive the message with joy. 
how many of you ever feel like you're joyful? You're, you don't need to raise your hands on these crazy questions, beautiful questions. Is How many of you feel the joy of the Lord? You know the joy of the Lord is in you. There you go. I told you not to, you couldn't help yourself. That's good. The joy of the Lord, what is it? Is my strength. No matter what's going to happen in the coming days and the coming years, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And that's what Thessalonians has to say. That's what Paul is telling them. He said, say beautiful, he said, uh, and you know of our concern for you from the way we live when we were with you. So with, so you receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering that is brought upon you. That it brought upon you. Now what does it say? Your commitment to Christ brought suffering upon you. I want to tell you something. This, uh, you, you, know, you know the gospel that's about to uh, run away and get away from us? It's that prosperity gospel. I'm not, and I'm not talking, uh, uh, in other words, here's what he's saying here. He says, because of your severe suffering, I brought you great joy. Not possessions. But the Holy Spirit brought us great joy. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not supposed to live in Christ and, and be, uh, be joyful in Christ, but it is not talking about mansions. It's not talking about... Uh, uh, four cars when we only need one. It's not talking about, I want this because I want it and God's my Father and He's going to give it to me. It's not talking about that. He's talking about a spirit. It comes from the Holy Ghost. Amen. Last I, I saw, the Holy Ghost does not own any factories dealing with uh, material things. Amen? But it comes from the Holy Ghost, the joy of the Lord, that overwhelming feeling that I count it great joy to walk with God. I count it great joy to express the praise of God that comes from my heart. It's great joy, and it comes from the Holy Ghost. When sadness is all that comes from your lips, no wonder there's no joy. It comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings the joy, the peace. He mentions up in, in verse uh, uh, 2, I think, he says, I give you grace and peace. That comes from the Holy Spirit. So I'm challenging you to understand that no matter what you're going to face, whether it's on an economic uh, role or the world or whatever, individually even, and we'll face things individually. You know, we've had... Uh, Either 11 or 12 that's passed away from this congregation in the last uh, uh, 18 months. And that leaves pain. That leaves pain in people's hearts. No matter what you're facing, no matter what you will face, the Holy Spirit will give you peace. Amen. Say amen. amen. The Holy Spirit will bring to you the joy that only comes from God. How do you think that Paul could bounce around all over, entered in, uh, wasn't he the one lowered in a basket at one time? I think so. And, and uh, uh, I mean, how in the world could he do that and then, and then write like this? Because he had the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord was his absolute strength. It wasn't his circumstances. It wasn't things being all right all the time. It was the fact that he was born of God and he was proclaiming who God was. Amen. Oh, man. Oh, man. What joy. The message, the message sometime of, of, the, of the grace story, the message of redemption has been hijacked by religion all over the world forever and ever. Here Jesus did this marvelous thing of forgiving us and, and, and causing us to be redeemed by the blood of Christ. Laid it all out and then all of a sudden churches and, and, and organizations come by and they just act like they own it. They possess it and make it into a religion. And we went through several processes of religions. 
Thanks be to God. I, I, I sense a coming together like never before. I sense a coming together of the believers in Christ, not religions, not churches, not names of churches, but the believers in Christ being raised up under the anointing, under the joy of the Lord. And even though the severe suffering may be brought upon us, that's okay. In spite of whatever the enemy can throw into your life. In, everybody say, in spite of. We proclaim that there will be joy in your heart and life because the joy comes of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is of God. Holy Spirit is God. Amen. Oh, thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Well, let's read on a little bit more. So, you receive the message with the joy, with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of your suffering. In this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. Now, some have difficulty with that phrase, uh, both us and the Lord, meaning you, you're, you're imitating. And you know, it, it's okay to imitate. It is okay to imitate humans. If, if it's the right kind of imitation, if it's the right kind of human. I think I shared with you the church that uh, before we built our school and, and building, we had a, a building, small bar nest, and, and uh, it was just packed all over. My only place to sit was with, uh, uh, this right here, the, the pulpit was more like uh, right here. And, that, that was, and so I, the only place to sit was right, right there, right there. That was it. So one time the church of uh, the kids, you know, rats like these guys, did a skit. You know what I'm talking about. Did a skit of, of the pastor. And they had me so mimicked that it frightened me. <laughs> Wynette Carter, whose mother that I've been talking about just passed away. But uh, Wynette Carter says... Uh, got up and demonstrated that when I'm uncomfortable with the speaker or somebody is saying something or they're talking too long that, they want to, that, that I just, I hit the side of my, and she did that and the whole place cracked out because they knew they had seen it over and over again. <laughs> and, I'm, and, and I don't even know what's happening. I'm telling you, it's easy to imitate. But I'm also telling you, be careful because it's easy for people to imitate you. So if you walk forth and you say, here, I'm proclaiming the good news, I'm proclaiming the grace of God, then please, my friend, are you listening to me? Yes. Please imitate Christ. Yes. So you're to imitate me, those character traits that, that are in me, that is like Christ, and that's all right, and that's what Paul is saying. You have imitated me as I followed Christ. Yes. But those things still in my heart and life that I've not that I'm not allowed the Holy Spirit to correct no one's own things that are of flesh that I just refuse to get rid of. Don't imitate those. Don't imitate those. I know this one's watching me a lot. You know, I don't know. But anyway, all of these are because that's what, they, that's what they're supposed to do. You're supposed to look at me. And, 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 and don't don't believe half of it, but I mean, you know, imitate that that part of me that's of Christ. In other words, the mercy, I have a heart of mercy, imitate that. But there's other traits that you should not. But Paul is saying, thanks be to God, here's a church who has demonstrated, they have imitated Paul and, and Barnabas and, and the, 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 the preachers that stayed there with them, they gazed upon them and they say, this is a man of God and I want to be like him. There's nothing wrong with that. And then they say, and this is the Christ that he's talking about. And I want to be like Christ. That's what it means. You imitated both us and the Lord. Oh, thanks be to God. Part of the problem that we have is people say, oh, don't imitate me. And I say to us, why not? Aren't you to the position that we can, that, that people can imitate at least the most, the biggest part of you? <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, I, don't, I don't say the right thing all the time. Then say the right thing all the time. That's in the grace of God. You hear me? That's in the joy of the Holy Spirit. 
You know the happy Christian, the one that's doing everything they know to do the best they can by the power of the Spirit. That's where the joy of the Lord is. The Christian that's condemned because of, of, uh, of, of not responding to the Holy Spirit, that's the person that has no joy. They may have eternal life, but they have no joy. Well, thank the Lord. So, okay. How many of you feel like you could be imitated? It's amazing, folks, how, how this works. Mothers and dads, you're... Your children are imitating you. They're imitating you. I would say, think of this yesterday. Uh, 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 what's his name? Uh, brought me over a watermelon, big watermelon. Mickey. Now, you understand, to go back to this uh, giving, I, I took uh, the best, I, I buy three watermelons at a time. Folks, I love watermelon. I go through a big one every week, usually six days. Mm. So anyway, I had these three worms, and I picked the, the best I had, and I took it over to uh, uh, Don and, and, and uh, Colin. Well, first thing he said, Pastor, this is way too big. <laughs> and I didn't have my small one out in the car, so I couldn't exchange. But it gave me my best. Mickey brought me one yesterday that was twice as big. It was the biggest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Don't, you know, just, just do what God wants you to do. Now, where was I at? <laughs> and it brought you in this way, you imitated both us and the Lord. Oh. Oh, I'm talking about a watermelon. <laughs> I remember telling my daughter and, and my son, but he got a little wise on it, but I said, uh, because this had seeds in it. Seeds, by the way, gives you the sweetest taste. That's a fact. So here he is. Uh, we, we're all gathered around because they, they don't like watermelon like their dad. And I'm telling my little girl, I said, don't swallow these seeds or a watermelon will grow in you. Yeah. Everybody said that before? Yeah. But you see, I can say it so convincingly. And I never, you know, and sometimes I, I did that all the time with my kids. But I, I, and sometimes I forgot to correct myself. This is how kids are watching you, paying attention to you. She goes to school in the first grade or kindergarten, whatever it was, and she insists, insists that watermelon seeds, if you swallow them, a watermelon will grow in you. And she got upset because nobody believed her. Well, a few of them did, but the teacher and so forth. And then she comes in and gets upset at her dad. You know how that goes. She was upset a lot, bless her heart. But what I'm trying to tell you, Im imitating... Is, is a powerful thing if it's done right. Yeah. Uh, oh my. I, I want to be a blessing to this younger generation. I want to be a blessing to you. But many of you, you're, you're veterans, your faith established. But, but they're going to believe whatever they see in this pastor and in you. And they're going to begin to say, oh well, I can live like that. I can be grouchy and, and, and go to heaven. <laughs> say amen. Amen. <laughs> Well, yeah, but you're going to be grouchy your whole life. Why live your life grouchy when well, you can live in the joy of the Lord? Hallelujah. That's the decision that you have to make. Thanks be to God. I want to live in joy, don't you? I believe that God has prepared this world for us, even with all the strife, to have the joy of the Lord as we go, as we go forth. So it's okay to imitate, but imitate the qualities that are good. Amen. Imitate the joy of the Lord in somebody and say, how did you get that? How do you have joy? Imitate the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the move of moving in the Spirit. Imitate that. Look at someone and say, how can I do that? What does that mean? Okay. As a result, you may, okay, all of this. Now, here, here's what he did. Here's what he, he says, first of all, we brought you the good news. It wasn't with words, but it was with power. Okay? And I think we talked about that last week, but it wasn't with words, but it was with power. Quit talking, if you're talking at all. Quit talking and examine your power. Examine the part that's coming forth from the heart. 
A great story falls flat if it's not from your heart. Are you listening to me? So he says, for when we brought you the good news, it was not with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. In other words, the power of the Holy Spirit was working in you as I shared with you the gospel. Pastor, I don't know who to talk to. I don't know who to share. I don't know who's... That's the Holy Ghost's responsibility. Yours is just open your mouth and proclaim the goodness. It's the Holy Spirit that saves by the name of Jesus. Are you listening? Amen. You don't save. You don't forgive. You just share as one who has been forgiven. Amen. One who has been healed. Or one who has faith to be healed. Do you understand? We, it's not like all past things that we uh, share. We share about the future. I know my God will heal me. I know my God will meet me at the day, last moment of the last breath of my life. He will meet me and he will carry me with him. I know that. Oh, thank God. And for somebody to feel that you know it from your heart and the Holy Spirit's working in their heart, there you go. You are an evangelist. I hate to say that word in that sense because we think of evangelist as what I'm doing. No, sir. We are an evangelist. Every single one of us. Thank the Lord. So, so let's go back over the process. For we have brought you good news. And it was, it was authenticated by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave us full assurance. Gave you full assurance that what I was saying was true. The Holy Ghost wants, is, is, is God. He wants to redeem that person. He'll give that person the sense that what you're saying is true. We, we act like, well, if I, don't, if I don't use the right verbiage, it's not going to work. It's not about your verbiage. It's about the Holy Ghost of God. Amen. It's about God, you, you using, God, the Holy Spirit using you, and God really using that person, planting the seed and saying, okay, come up now. Come up and come know the Lord. Amen. Amen. So... And you know of, of our concern for you from the way we lived when we were with you. It's good to be concerned about people. I don't know what's going on here, but I, I'm being shot at, shocked up, shocked. Okay. And you know of our concern for you. What did you say? Stay still? I can't stay still. And you know of our concern for you from the way we live when we were with you. So you receive the message with joy from the Holy Spirit. So here's what happened. He brought the good news. Brought the good news with the anointing power. Paul and, 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 and Barnabas and, and, and uh, the other disciples that came, brothers that came with them. And he says, I observed. I observed what was going on. You observed me while I was living with you. While I was there, you, you, you looked at us. You saw something about us that was different. If, you, if, if the persons that you're trying to bring the joy of the Lord to can't see something different in you than in them, don't bother. That really puts a mark on Christianity. Don't bother. Well, can you say amen? amen. Hmm. Okay. So he says, you receive the message now. He says, and here I applaud you. You received it with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of your suffering. You've imitated both us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all the believers in, in Greece. Okay. Here we go. Next ten minutes. How many examples do we have here this morning? You might as well raise your hand because every one of us is. Every one of us. We are examples. It doesn't necessarily mean in some cases that I'm the best example. But if I'm going to call myself a Christian, then automatically I am determined to be an example of Christianity. I don't 
don't have time to get into the idols. That it'll be the next next verse, I guess, uh, this morning. But we 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 declare ourselves to be examples, whether whether we say we are or not, we are. Oh, I'm a Christian. I have I have been redeemed. I've laid I have laid my sins down at the altar, and Jesus has rescued me. Oh, thank God. When you say that, and you say, and I am a Christian. I am a person of God. That assumes, you, we assume that as you're looking at that, you have denied yourself. You've laid up, down your own self, and you've taken up the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm assuming that. Claudette, when you tell me that, that's the first thing I assume. If I know anything about the gospel at all. Now, if you haven't done that, or if you've halfway done that, you're still an example. Amen. You're still an example. If you had done it, I mean, you've completely surrendered. Oh, what an example. And that's what Paul is, is referring to. He said, you, you, you've imitated me, and, and, and we've imitated Christ. And he said, as a result, you become an example. In other words, you have come to Christ. You have believed upon Him. You have taking on his character. Hallelujah. Folks, your character is what gets you in trouble. My character is what stymies me in my life. And I got a pretty decent character. Everybody lives with me says so. That, that's a joke. But my character stymies me, but not the character of Christ. Not the character of Christ. It doesn't. It causes me to grow. It causes me to become bigger and bolder than I've ever thought or dreamed. And that's what he's referring to. He said, you become an example to all the believers. All the, in other words, they were talking in such a way that people were becoming believers every day. They were revolutionizing that entire area. Evangelizing, if you will. People were coming to Christ and they were going out on ships and going all over the world. Don't tell me God is not in this business. He knows exactly what's going on. He sent those boys down to a, the main city of the world at that time, and it went forth. It went forth. Oh, hallelujah. I suggest to you that we understand the value of being an example. Before we become a, a really spiritually mature church, we have to understand that everything I do and say, I'm setting an example for, for someone. Amen. For someone. Thank the Lord. And the beauty of that is, the beauty of that is, it can lead people to Christ. It can save them from a devil's hell. It can redeem them. Oh, thank God. It can give them life and life eternal. If you are an example, because if, by being an example now, you're able to say and speak the words of truth because of what Christ has put in your life. That's called, that's called being an evangelist. I would suggest to us, as we look at this last verse, <clears throat> oh, Jesus, whom God raised from the dead, he is the one who has rescued us from the terrors of the coming judgment. You know what I I believe, I believe that even the people in darkness, the unredeemed, knows that there's something about to happen. Amen. Do you sense that, that there's a stirring out there in humanity, a stirring up? It comes out with anger, it comes out with mistrust, it comes out with anxiety, it comes out with, and, and so people are taking their lives, they, there's, there's no peace. There's nothing. It's just it's just a mess. You know why? Because down deep, there's a sense that something is happening. I've used the phrase. I want you to start thinking about using it. It's not the last day. It's the last hour of the last day. And I believe it. How long is an hour? I don't know. Neither do you. We don't know how long a day is. But it's the last hour. So I want us to begin to think in terms of being the last hour and God had put so much truth into me. What 
am I being an example for? Who am I being an example to? First of all, that starts in our family. Parents, pray like you've never prayed before. Judine, where, where's that? Where, where's he at? Okay. Oh, there he is, sitting by his mom. That's a good place. Pray for that boy like you've never prayed. That young man is about to enter into a new era to where the mind is the main target. The mind is the main target. So when we start about evangelism, it's about, and, and, and uh, the Watsons has three boys that's running all over the world. How, and, and I talk to them, they've got good sound minds, and I say to myself, how in the world? Mine's not that sound, and I don't travel anywhere. But things are going into your head, being put into your spirit. We need to be an evangelistic church. Amen. Not like one, two, and three, this is how you get saved. It's like, tell the grace story to the point that grace is coming out of your heart, mercy is coming out of your heart. And you're overwhelmed with it. And that will touch somebody's life. That will touch somebody's life. It happens all the time. Everywhere around it happens. It can happen to you. It wants to happen with you. The message of Jesus was contagious, obviously. Was it contagious? It came in and they got a hold of it. Hmm. How many of you, when you first came to Christ, first thing you want to do is tell somebody? If you didn't want to tell somebody, you probably need to come to Christ again. Well, the first thing you want to do is tell, tell somebody, oh, I got saved. I couldn't wait to tell my dad. Couldn't wait to tell my dad. Didn't do any good for a lot of years after that, but I couldn't wait to tell him. I gave my heart to the Lord. And all that baggage that was, I was hanging on to just fell off. And I felt the joy of the Lord like I never had before. And then I began to tell people all over how much the Lord meant to me and how I loved Him. It's the same. And friends, that doesn't have to go away. That can become part of our style. Look at opportunities. Let opportunities challenge you to share the gospel, to share the good news. I suppose the most difficult task in our following after Christ is to be able to do away with our own flesh and our own selves. That has to be the most difficult. We'll get more into that next week because we'll be dealing with uh, idols. But there's just so much that would challenge us today. So much that would challenge us to pull us away from the cross. One of those idols is that we'll do this now is, is our uh, our great, what do you call it, uh, the, the, the self stuff, and, and what is that called? Uh, avionics? No, that's back to, that's, uh, okay, whatever. <laughs> do you know how many young people know how many people cannot sit through an hour class of any kind without texting or being text? They say, they say it's a, yeah, you're not allowed to take it away from kids in school. Is that right? No, they can't have phones in school. In the rooms, they have them outside. Okay, good. Thanks, Mike. And I, I guarantee you that other places they, they can they, they're not allowed to take it away. But nonetheless, how many how many when we come together to worship and to honor the Lord? Uh, oh my, I don't know how to say a whole lot. It could be television. It could be computer. It can be anything. It can be games. I've got a, a grandson. I've never seen phones move so fast. Didn't know what in the world they were doing. I said, son, you want to go uh, here and there? Well, where are we going? I tell them, oh, no, I'd rather be do this. And, and it's it, we get caught up in that, and we don't understand. We don't seem to have an insight that that drags us into it doesn't necessarily drag us down, but it drags our time. We don't, there's only 24 hours in a day. And if I can capture you into a moment and expand that moment that deals only with you and the flesh, that's a moment that you will not spend with God. 
That's all it is. It doesn't make it sin unless we make it sin. Amen. We like to say everything, and no, it's not sinful. It's if I don't have control of my flesh, I'll make it sin. <laughs> Thank God. That's a, that's a good way to put that. Write that down somewhere. It is so important that we understand that anything, anything that hinders us from the good news and the excitement of it, that allowing it to become contagious in our hearts and contagious to the point, I've got to share this. I've got to talk about this. Oh my. I look for a chance. I was at a restaurant the other day with, uh, with someone here, Bill, and uh, this young man, I had him this close to coming to church. Told him I would bring a uh, uh, some of the old men, to, uh, this is a 22-year-old boy, some old men to liven him up the next day, and I didn't make it to the meeting at all. So i got to try it over again, because he was, yeah, oh man, handsome dude, just a good man, I could say, good boy. But you look for those, because it's contagious. I want everybody to know Jesus. I want everybody to feel the love of Christ. And I want to challenge you, and I'll, I'll put more meat on this next week. I want to challenge you. Let me give you an example of evangelism. This young man that I had that I introduced you to, uh, uh, Leonard, uh, uh, Jared. This young man, he he uh, he was so he's so excited. He came in the office. He said, "Pastor, I want to meet with you every week, and want to just talk to you about what I want, what the Lord wants, and just understand the Word." I said, "Okay." So the latest is this, and I like this. He said, I've got some friends that will not walk into church. Because you see, church is taught out there in the, in, in the secular world. It is taught that you disrespect church. Now, they, some have a few uh, uh, reasons for that, but not many. It's just a matter that darkness hates the body of Christ. You know that. A lie hates the truth. Because when truth comes, a lie has to, is dispelled, is cast away. And a lie wants to thrive. It wants to live. That's why it looks for the weakest person in the church if it wants to spread something. That's free. That's free. So here we are with this, with, with this sharing of the gospel and, and this proclamation that he is the Lord. He is the Lord. And we just sort of hang on to it. And we hang on to it. Folks, you've got a lot to say. you got a lot to say. Oh, Jared, he says, I want to find people that will not or do not or not comfortable in church. He said, I've got three or four, and I want to take them and have a Bible study, a group study. He said, I can't do it at church, so where can I do it? I said, well, Miguel, Michaela lives over there. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I said, you can do it at my house. You can do it wherever. Can't be at church because he said they won't come. Isn't that amazing? But guess what he's doing? Instead of crying, I can't get anybody to come. He said, I'm just going to go sit with them and talk about the Word. See, that's the evangelistic heart. And we can all have that. We can all have that. And we must all seek for that. When we all become an evangelist, you know how you do it? Alan, don't, don't be laughing. You know how we do it? We take one person, every one of us right now, Okay, just think about this. If every one of us was to just say, I, I want to find somebody to bring to the Lord. Maybe bring to church, but bring to the Lord first and foremost. Before now, between now and Christmas, what do you think? What do you think? A, every seat would be filled. But greater than that, the kingdom of God would be blessed. The kingdom of God would be lifted up. The cross of Christ would be exalt, exalted in other homes, in other places. And then the rippling effects from that is so dynamic. Oh, thank God. Just think about that and I'll, I'll put some more uh, grease on that wheel next week, hopefully. I will conclude with this. Let's go to John, our verses in John. 
He said, but I'll send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. And you must also testify about me because you have been with me from the beginning of my ministry. He said, you must also testify about me because you have been with me. Are we sharing our great story? We've been with him. Jesus came into my life when I was 14 years old. I've been with him a long time in my life. Do you understand what I'm saying? He said, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. He comes. He's the spirit of truth. He will come into us and bringing the message of, of God the Father. That he gave his son for our salvation. But this whole message of truth, and you must also testify about me. In other words, everything that you give, that the Father has given me, I've given you. I've given the Holy Spirit, which gives you. We have all access to being whatever God wants us to be. It's the Holy Ghost of God. Everybody say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. That's where He is. That's where He dwells in your heart. If we have access to Him, we can become whatever God wants us to be. But if we, if we sit back and do nothing, we can't. He's not going to force it on us. He's just called us to take up your cross and follow me. And lastly, and you must also testify in all that belongs to the Father's mind. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever He receives from me. That's the Spirit of truth. Whatever He receives from Him. Thank God. You want to imitate? Imitate Christ. You want to imitate? Read about Paul and how he handled his suffering and imitating. And maybe there's, uh, there's saints. I imitate my mother in, in, in so many ways. I don't imitate my father who came to know the Lord right at the very end of his life. So be wise with who you imitate. But look at, and, and, and oh my fr friends, let's be wise about what we, what we project from our hearts and our faith. Oh, thank God. I, I got a, 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 a Sister Heather uh, sends me three texts a week about just to encourage. Pastor, I'm praying for you this week. That's a good invitation for someone that has that heart of mercy. I, imitate uh, Mickey and bring me a watermelon, everybody. <laughs> you know, we imitate good, we imitate words of goodness and acts of goodness and blessings unto the Lord. It's okay. Oh, hallelujah. It's not like we're supposed to divorce ourselves from one another. Let, let God be God and I want to honor what I can. Honor what's obviously Christ in you. And pray for what I may see that's not Christ. That's how you handle that. Oh, thank God. Would you stand please? Jesus, give us your passion. Give us your passion. When you looked over Israel, over Jerusalem, and you wept, give me your passion. Give us, make us contagious, Lord, so that the love of Christ is so dug into our hearts that it just spills out. And the passion of Christ just spills out. That mercy, the gift of mercy just follows us and precedes us. That grace will abound in our lives, oh God. And the one thing that the world doesn't understand is love. And that's exactly where it comes from, is you. You are the giver of love. You're the author of love. And that's why it can't know you. It doesn't know love because it doesn't know you. But Father, we do. We're your church and we know you. We know your love. We know your grace. We know all that you've given us. And Lord, we give it to you. We want to be able to give it to those around us. We want to proclaim it. Oh, thank God. That's what makes a mature church. One that's talking about Jesus all the time. One that's sharing who you are. Your love and your graciousness. If you have a need this morning, would you come? Would you come and just let's, let's pray? Maybe you want to be more like Christ. Maybe you want... Maybe you want your image that you're projecting from Christ, about Christ, to be stronger and bolder. 
You can have that this morning. The power of the Holy Spirit will come alive in you, enable you in your and strengthen you. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Father, I pray that you would move in our midst today, that you would cause us to be challenged, challenged just to share our story, challenged to be like, as a church, as a church, to be like the Thessalonians. The Thessalonian letter was not a a church of don'ts, but it was a church of do's, of what you're doing. And Lord, that's who we are. We're a church of doing. We just want to do more. We want to be more encouraged. We want to encourage others more. We want to be your example. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. to God. I don't want to be mediocre to you. I want to be contagious with my faith. Contagious with my grace story. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Bless your holy name. Oh, thank the Lord. There was a sign just out of Washington, D.C. a little while ago during the pandemic, just the beginning of the pandemic, I believe it was, and it says, this church has closed for good. This church is closed for good. Somebody wrote under it, said, we don't miss you because we don't know who you were. Thank God we have people that we have the salt of the earth in this building. If we were raptured up tomorrow, the world would miss you. The world would know something's happened. <laughs> but he's not raptured us up. So let the world know.